time to key people. We're in the middle of COVID-19. Makes everything a little bit more special, a little harder, but we're muddling through. So I'm here at the home. Let me take the mask off. I'm more than six feet away. I'm at the home of Dr. Paul Gleck and Dr. Joan Gleck. Dr. Joan is an allergist and Dr. Paul is an OBGYN specialist. Both had their practice at the Baptist Hospital over in Kendall. Now they're retired. But their passion, their hobbies, Native American art. They travel extensively to the Pacific Northwest, Alaska, Washington, and also up into British Columbia. So we're here at their home. They've got some amazing artifacts. We're going to learn a lot. Catcher's beak. They would pick up the oysters and drop them on the rocks. And then get the oyster out. This is a ram. Oh, yes. yes with I his horns. That. This is a shaman capturing a witch, holding her by her braided hair. And this is a, a, a bear. A dog. Or a, a dog. bear or a dog. And then on the bottom is the image of a, a bird. Plus the oh feet. My gosh, yes. And these are the feet of the oyster catcher. <laughs> so you can see the complex iconography all represented in one piece. And this great story that this piece represents with this beautiful iconography. This is a chief rattle. And now the chief there's the raven oh, yeah. with the wings yeah. and the beak. And there's the man on the back of the raven with a frog and the tongue communicating. This way, because if you hold it this way, the raven flies away. And then there's the bird spirit on the, on the bottom. It's very intricate. How oh, very, yeah. very yeah, detailed. How they yeah. carve it. And what kind of wood do they normally use? Cedar. They use cedar or, or older or older. older. They use cedar for almost everything. <laughs> you won't get to do this when you see it in the museum. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. What got you interested in anthropology in the Pacific Northwest? Coming from Florida, that's a long way away. Well, Joan and I grew up in the Northeast. I was born in Boston, Joan in Philadelphia, and we met in medical school in New York. We were married during our time in medical school. Since we grew up in big cities in the East, well, we decided for our honeymoon we wanted to see national parks and we wanted to see Native American sites. Joan was an anthropology major in college and really fell in love with the First Nations of this country. And so basically we took a map, put a lot of dots on the map, national parks, Native American sites, and connected the dots. We, had to, we were married in July, and we had to get to Los Angeles. We were going to do study and research for three months at L.A. County Hospital. And so we had a, a two-month period of time meandering around the country connecting these dots. We traveled almost 7,000 miles. We saw amazing sights. But when we saw the art of the Northwest Coast, we, f we fell in love with the aesthetic. But then over time, as we began to collect, we studied it and quickly learned that this culture from which this art sprung was amazing. And so we then started studying the culture that created the art. The premise that we have is that the environment of the Northwest Coast, which is a very special environment, we'll talk about that, created this beautiful culture. And from this beautiful culture sprung this amazing aesthetic that we call art. But interestingly enough, the First Nations of the Northwest Coast did not have a word for art. To them, this was very spiritual, and the art they depicted really was a depiction of spirits that inhabited the world, inhabited every object, animate and inanimate, and, and inhabited us. So first, let's talk a little bit about the environment. The Northwest Coast was settled by people 15,000 to 2,000 years ago that came across a land bridge connecting Siberia with Alaska. And this is really where the First Nations of North and South America, by and large, came from. The group that settled along the Northwest Coast had a fantastic environment. The coastal area of the Northwest, stretching from the Columbia River in Oregon up through Southeast Alaska, has a relatively temperate climate because of the Japanese current, similar to our Gulf Stream on the East Coast. They were relatively protected from tribes from the interior by large mountains. They had inlets that, that facilitated navigation, 
but also these inlets provided a safety from other tribes and villages grew up along the inlets and they traveled by canoe from village to village to trade but also to do other activities. Within the forest of the northwest coast there was abundant vegetation including very tall straight cedar trees and these were wonderful supplies for wood. They used that to construct their shelters and they used the wood to construct the long canoes that they used. Also they didn't want to waste anything and so the cedar tree provided the bark and they actually used the bark to weave into clothing. Within the forest there was also an abundant supply of berries and roots that the women could harvest and use as a food source. And this is a picture of a woman actually wearing what's called a burden basket as she's going out to gather these supplies from the, the forests. There was also abundant wildlife within the forests. They have bear, deer, sheep, uh, land otters, and the people of the Northwest Coast actually hunted and trapped these animals. One of the techniques that they used was called a deadfall trap, in which they had a very large rock that was supported by two twigs attached to a bait that was under the large rock. When the animal came and, and picked up the bait, it would then cause the rock to fall on top of them, these small animals, and that's how they would trap small animals. These traps are still used today, but in the time of the First Nations of the Northwest Coast, they adorned the trigger stick of this trap, called a trap stick, with images of animals. And these two trap sticks show images of birds that were spirit helpers to help them in their hunting. The rivers were very important to the tribes of the Northwest as a source of navigation and, and movement, but also they would trap beaver along the river for the pelt. And the most important reason of uh, supply that came out of the river were salmon. Salmon is one of their staples for food. And this, these pictures illustrate the salmon and drawings of salmon with what uh, the Native Americans called form lines. The technique of fishing actually is still being used today in some areas. They would build these traps called fish weir that would basically think of it herding the salmon into a small area during their spawning going upriver. And the Native Americans would use these long harpoons with the barbs at the end, the barbs were made from animal bone, to spear the fish as they were being trapped in these fish weir. The seashore was very important to the Native Americans and along the coast the women would go out and collect clams and other bivalves as using that as another source of their food. The sea itself was very important, and the most important fish that came from the ocean was halibut. They would go out in these 16-foot boats to fish for halibut. And the fishing technique was one that was actually uh, scoffed on by Westerners when they finally had contact with these people. They used these things called halibut hooks. The halibut hook is pictured here. You can see has two armatures. One of them has a barb, a metal barb, and the other one has an effigy of an animal or a person. And this effigy would facilitate the fish getting caught. The distance between the barb and the effigy was also important. If, as you may know, halibut can grow to be quite large. <clears throat> Pictured in this slide is a woman who caught a 322-pound halibut. Imagine bringing a fish that big into a 16-foot open boat in the middle of an ocean. It could swamp the boat. So they wanted to regulate the size of the halibut, not too big, but big enough to be a significant food source. And so the distance between the barb and the effigy helped control that. The other thing pictured on this slide is what's called a fish club. When this fish was landed in the boat, it would be thrashing around and again, they didn't want the fish to swamp the boat, so they would hit it on the head with this club to subdue it and stop it from thrashing around. This next slide pictures a number of different halibut hooks uh, showing different effigies. One of them shows a bird called an oyster catcher with an oyster in its mouth. Another is a human figure, 
and the third is the sea otter. Speaking of sea otters, that was another important source of fur and shelter for these First Nation tribes. And they would actually hunt the sea otter with a bow and arrow. And here's a picture, the photographs of Edward Curtis, a photographer in the early 1900s, showing a Native American out hunting sea otter. Western contact with the tribes of the Northeast Coast underwent a number of stages. Initially, there was exploration by Spanish and English in the late 1700s. This was soon followed by trade when the whaling fleets came to these areas and needed to trade for supplies. They would trade for the food. They would also trade to bring home some of these pelts from the sea otter and some of the pelts from the beaver. And when they brought these back home to New England and England, and also the Russians were there, they realized that this was a great source of fur and started colonization. And one of the companies that took root there actually was a Hudson Bay company, uh, which was trading significantly in animal pelts. Once these trade companies established their footprint there, they were then followed by missionaries who tried to convert the tribes to Christianity. In the the late 1800s, early 20th century, anthropologists came to the Northwest Coast to study these tribes. They didn't have a written language and people knew little about their culture. And so Franz Boas, the father of cultural anthropology, spent significant time there learning about the culture, writing about the culture, actually learning the stories, and even gave the people of the Northwest Coast their first written language. Fran Boaz subsequently became a professor of anthropology at Columbia University. Stories from the Northwest Coast started coming back to the East and tourism came soon after that. So let me show you some of the things that resulted from this contact with the Western society. This is a pipe that was produced by the natives of the Northwest Coast. The tobacco was given to them by these uh, traders. And you can see the pipe is a shape of man's head. Now the man has a white face representing the Caucasians that these Native Americans were contacting. And he also has a funny hat. This is a hat of a Russian sailor. The bowl of the hat where the tobacco would go was actually the gun barrel that the natives traded with and then cut up these gun barrels and actually used the gun barrel uh, for the pipes. This is a figure of a sailing captain made from a material called argillite that was very unique to the Northwest Coast. Here's some additional pipes. So the one on the left shows a clam shell and an octopus, and the one on the right is the depiction of a sea otter. This is some posters from the 1920s and 1930s from a number of airlines, cruise companies, and from the Trans-Canadian Railroad touting the tourism of Southeast Alaska. And all of them, all of them highlighted the no tribes of the Northwest Coast calling this area the land of the totems. The, talking about the totem poles, it was so prominent and so unique to this area. This is a totem pole carved by a famous Native American carver, Charlie James from the 1920s. And this was folk art. People like Charlie James would come and meet the airplanes and meet the cruise ships and meet the trains coming to this region and sell these little totem poles called folk art. And this was really looked down on at the time by serious collectors. And now they're quite valuable and very important in the art of the Northwest Coast. So this is an incredible environment that they grew up with. But from this environment sprang an even more incredible culture that Joan's gonna talk a little bit about. The nice thing about this collecting this is, well, our very first mask we got on our honeymoon, and we, had a, we were students, and we scraped together as, all our expendable money. So when you think about the culture of the Northwest Coast, it's good to realize that these tribes basically lived in a grocery store. So they had a lot of free time. They didn't have to work that hard for their food supply, as hard as some of the other tribes that were in the plains. They could live in one place. They didn't have to migrate back and forth like the people who had to use teepees on the backs of horses. So their, their lifestyle was much more um, attuned to living with nature and also having free time during which they could use their creativity. Talking about the village, they actually had villages 
and they built their houses out of these cedar trees. They called them a long house. And in the long house, there would be multiple families, and that would be where they would have ceremonies, where they would have dances and special events. On the outside of the long house, they would paint the symbols of the spirits that represented their tribe. So it usually would be a raven or an eagle or some other animal spirit. And the reason they painted it on the front of the long house, which faced the water, was that when other tribes would come to visit, they would be able to see, it's almost like a signpost, they would say, okay, that's the home of the beaver tribe. There they are, we can see the beaver on the front of their house, and they know they would be able to go into the right inlet. In this slide, you can see that they even had carvings and giant poles representing the animals that were symbolic for their own tribe. Uh, these poles are called clan poles, which represent the tribe. The one on the left is a, is a raven, and you can always tell a raven because they'll have a longer beak, and you can see the wings on the sides. The one on the right is a beaver. You can always tell a beaver because he has large front teeth, and he's holding a stick, and you can see the cross-hatched tail. The story of that particular pole, that's a pole that Paul and I commissioned. And we wanted a beaver because Paul went to a school where the beaver is the mascot, MIT. And we also wanted a raven, because the raven is very central to many of the stories of the Northwest, and a lot of the origin stories deal with the raven. So we contacted uh, artists, and they said they couldn't do a beaver and a raven. And we said, well, but when we were in Alaska, we saw poles that had beavers and ravens. And they said, well, those are the Kwakutl. They'll do anything for money. But we are Haida, and we won't. The Beaver goes with an eagle. If you want a raven, you have to have a bear. So we thought about it. We decided we really wanted the beaver. So we got the beaver and the eagle. And they said, it's OK. Nobody's going to know it's an eagle. They'll think it's a raven. So that's the story of our poll. Uh, when we were in Alaska, we, in British Columbia, we went to a place that's considered very sacred. Uh, these tribes have been living in this area for thousands of years. and as Paul mentioned, they don't have a word for art, and they don't have a concept for art. When they carve things, they carve it to represent spirits that they're celebrating or that they're communing with. And these things are not considered special in any way of needing preserving, so that when they have a pole, the pole is erected outside, and it's allowed to decay and go back to the earth. When we went to Queen Charlotte Island, we went to a place called Haida, Haida Gwaii, which is an old, old settlement that is considered sacred. Only a few people can go at one time. And there they have these old totem poles that are still going back to the earth. And you can see some of the images, which are just like the images they carve now, but these are the ancient ones. So you realize how old the culture really is. One of the things that's very important to the culture of the Northwest is something called a potlatch. And what that did was it, it created a feeling of community and enabled the tribes to exist with each other more peacefully than they would have otherwise by f facilitating trade. Unfortunately, the Canadian government didn't realize all the purposes of the potlatch, so they banned it in 1884. And it was banned until 1950. If anyone was found to celebrate the potlatch, they were arrested and put in jail. That's, how severe the government laws were. The potlatch is basically a four-day feast. It's generally to celebrate some big occasion, like someone becoming a chief, or a marriage that takes place, a uh, coming of age. So uh, one tribe and one chief would invite several other communities to come to their village. We, it could be hundred, a couple hundred people at one time. And one of the things that was very crucial to the potlatch was the ability of the chief who was giving it to show that he was so generous, he gave gifts to everyone who came to thank them for coming. In return, he would tell them his stories because the chief was the owner of the stories and was the only one who was allowed to tell their story. The chief also owned the songs that went with the stories, the dances, and they would perform for the other tribes. In return, somewhere along the future, 
the other tribe's chief would have to invite that chief and his whole community to their village and have another potlatch. It kind of became like a competition to see who could give away more because the more you gave away, the more status you would accrue. So I think the Canadians thought it was very wasteful that the tribes were giving things so much away, and that's part of the reason they outlawed it. Also, they wanted to assimilate the tribes into, into Western society, so they forbade them from speaking the language, and they took the children and put them into boarding schools, and they had all kinds of things to try and you know, assimilate the tribes. But fortunately for us, a lot of the traditions were maintained in secret even the dances and the carvers carved in secret would perform their potlatches with the masks and wearing capes and, and rattles and dances. And, uh, and then they would just destroy the things that they had made or bury them so they couldn't be found. Otherwise, they would have been put in jail. It's interesting because when you, when you read these different stories, and I, I became a reader at the Library of Congress to research the stories because I was so interested. When you read the stories from the different tribes, you'll find variations of the same story. Because think about it, if a, if a whole, whole tribe comes and listens to a story and they go home, they're going to want to tell their stories. They're going to want to tell, you know, say, hey, you know, I heard this story and it's really cool, but it'll change as they tell it. Just like the telephone chain, mm -hmm. it changes as you go along. So this, the stories in the north are more different from the, than the stories in the south than they are from the ones in the middle, when you think about the whole coast that's, that's all lined up. And there are some instruments that are used in the Northwest. The loudest instrument is something called a box drum. Uh, it's made by using a special technique that was developed in the Northwest called kerfing. What, what happens is they take a piece of cedar, a plank of wood, and soak it so it gets soft and malleable. And then uh, cuts are made, they're called kerfs, so that the wood can be bent. And you end up with one piece of wood being turned into a box. So you only have to secure one edge. And the box is suspended on a rope outside the longhouse, and somebody beats it on the inside. And it said the sound can travel for miles over the water so that the villagers coming in not only see the image on the longhouse, but they can hear the drum and they know they're heading into the right area. The box drum that we have on the slide has an image of an octopus holding a salmon. Uh, this is a picture of a whistle that was used by a chief during a potlatch. We have a short video of a dance that's done using a, a raven mask. That's, some of the masks could be six or eight feet long and one man would be holding them. The mask has cedar bark coming down over the whole body, so you think it's the bird. I mean, these were very dramatic events. Listen carefully, you can hear him making the noise of the raven, which is an awk awk. They would have uh, people coming down from the ceiling. They would have people coming up through the floor. It was, it was really like the Broadway shows that, that we have now. They would have those in their longhouses. This is just a slide showing the regalia that they wear when they have a potlatch, when they have a feast. They want to get dressed up in all their best finery. So you can see the chief holding his drum with a symbol of an eagle. He's wearing an apron. He's wearing a headdress and a, with a frontlet on it that has a, a symbol of an animal. The other men are wearing button blankets. One has something called an octopus bag on his shoulder that comes down that has all the four little uh, appendages coming down from it on each side. So it's eight like an octopus. And then the other 
picture shows a feast bowl that's used during the potlatch. It's so enormous, it has to be brought out on wheels. These are just natives today that still celebrate the potlatch, and you can see it's a living culture. It hasn't died. Uh, so they have the little baby dressed up with his little button blanket and his headdress and with a little frontlet. The grandfather in the bottom picture feeding the fire in the longhouse. In the potlatch, the stories are told, and I've always been fascinated with the stories because they really give meaning to the art. Otherwise, you're just looking at something that's an interesting figure. So as an example, if you look at a picture of a giant boat with a house on it and pairs of animals marching onto the boat, it's an interesting picture, but if you know the story that goes with the picture, it gives it much more meaning. The same thing is true of native art and native culture. When you know the story, it gives the art more meaning. So this is a picture of a, a sculpture of a raven sitting on a clamshell. And there are people coming out of the clamshell. Well, this is the origin of man. Ah. These villages are right on the water. So the raven was walking along the seashore and he saw a clamshell, but there was noise coming from the clamshell, which is not normal. So he's very curious. He goes over and he pecks at the clamshell and he opens it up and lo and behold, man comes out of the clamshell. This is another story with raven. When the earth started, all the animals were running around and it was very dark and they were bumping into each other and it wasn't very pleasant. But Raven heard that there was a spirit in the sky that had light that he hid in a box. So Raven, being very clever, flew up into the sky, managed to sneak into the house of the spirit, and uh, pretending to be his grandchild, complained enough that the spirit decided he would open the box and give the Raven something to play with. So he pulled out the ball that was the sun. And the Raven who went up there was white had white feathers. When he grabbed the sun, Raven saw the sun, he grabbed the sun in his beak and flew out the smoke hole of the spirit's house. Thus he became black. And he was able to bring light to the world. So when you see an image of a bird with a long beak holding a disc in his mouth or a ball in his mouth, you know that's the story of Raven bringing the light to the world. And we have several images of that. And actually, my necklace has a sun. And I have another piece on the other side that goes on the back of this that's the raven. And it sits in, the disc sits in the mouth of a bird. So it's raven bringing the sun in jewelry. <laughs> and the other thing that stories do is, aside from explaining origins and how things came to be, uh, they also give morality and talk about behavior and what we're supposed to do in society. So those stories exist in the Northwest Coast as well. And when you think about the behavior of children, mothers are always telling their children, don't wander off, don't get lost, stay close to home. And in the Northwest, they would say, well, don't wander into the forest alone because you'll get taken by Sinoqua, the wild woman of the woods. She's very large. She's very hairy. She's always shown with a pursed mouth with blood red lips because she actually picks up the children, throws them into her burden basket, takes them home and eats them. So this is enough to keep children close to home. But there's another story that goes with this. And there are many, many variations of the story. But the one I like is the Sunoco was wandering in the woods. She found two small children, a brother and sister. She picked them up and put them in her basket, took them home. And as she was preparing the fire to cook them, she noticed the little girl had these lovely earrings in her ears. And she said, oh, she's not very bright. She said, oh, those earrings are pretty. And the little girl says, well, I'd be happy to give them to you. But they're for pierced ears, and you don't have pierced ears. And Sunoco looks very sad, and the little girl says, well, I'll be happy to pierce your ears for you, and you, and you can have my earrings. And Sunoco says, oh, that's good. How do we, you know, so the little girl says, well, I need you to lay down, because she's very large. I need you to lay down on the floor and give me something sharp so I can pierce your ear. <laughs> so Sunoco does, and the little girl pierces her ear and, and pushes it in so hard that she's pinned to the floor. And by this time, the parents were able to find them, 
and save the children from Sinoqua. And what the parents decide to do is throw Sinoqua into the fire so she won't bother their children anymore. And as they're doing this, Sinoqua says, you may think you're getting rid of me, but I will come back and suck your blood. And as she turns into ash, in the fire, out come the mosquitoes. Mosquitoes. She turned into mosquitoes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Isn't that a great story? So, and this is a picture of the bird in basket and also a mask of a mosquito. We have a couple of those. <laughs> One more story. Uh, there's a rattle that's used only by chiefs. And you realize the chief is the owner of the stories and the owner of the songs, and the chief is the one who erects totem poles, which actually are not worshipped. The totem poles have the spirits of things that are important to the tribe and to the chief. So this rattle is called a raven rattle. We know raven is important. It shows the raven holding something in his beak, and it also shows a man on his back. And from the man's mouth, there's a tongue to an animal. So there's a tongue that communicates from the animal spirit. Or this rattle in the picture has um, another raven on it. We have one with a frog on it. So it's kind of an odd assortment of images to just represent raven bringing the sun. And when I asked many natives and collectors and dealers, I said, what, is this, what does this mean? Because I was really interested in the story. They said, oh, it's the raven bringing the sun. I said, no, nah, I don't think so. So in my research, I found several other stories, which I compiled. I wrote a story on my own of how the chief, who was extremely poor, he didn't have stories, and he didn't have any masks. He was a poor chief. He didn't have any status was so upset he went into the woods for four days of fasting and communing and drinking herbs and he went into a trance. He fell asleep on this big rock. He woke up and there was an animal sitting on his chest communicating and the animal said to him, don't move, you are on the back of Raven and Raven is going to fly you to get what you have been wishing for to get your own stories and your own regalia so you can be a great chief. So he holds very still and they fly to the spirit world and he sees this totem pole coming up through the clouds and it's alive. It's making all these noises. The raven is going awk awk and the whales are whooshing and everything is moving and, and raven lands there. So the chief crawls into this long house and he sees the spirits dancing but they're not animals. They've hung up their animal coats and they're dancing like people and they look like people. And they, the spirits sense that there's someone there who shouldn't be there. And when they see this chief, they get very upset. They say, you know, you're not supposed to be here and no one is supposed to see us like this. And you are not to tell anyone what you have seen in return for which we will give you whatever you wish. So the chief says, well, I want your dances, I want your songs, I want your rattles, I want your pole, I want your, you know, I want your masks, give me, you know, so I can be a great chief. And they say, okay, but everything we give you will be magical and it will disappear after you've used it once. This is no problem. So they wrap it all up and they put it into a box which Raven carries in his beak with a chief on his back, back to the village. They land in the village, Raven drops the bock, the chief gets off, the raven flies away, and all the villagers come out and they say, Chief, where have you been? We were so worried. And he says, oh, I was only gone for a few days. They said, no, you were gone for four years. And, oh, okay, but look, I have brought you back miracles. And he opens the box and everything pops out, the totems and the masks and everything comes out, they dance, they sing, and he becomes a great chief. And as a memory of that episode, we have the raven rattle. The other part of the culture of the Northwest that I wanted to talk about was the shamans. Shamans were very, very important for many years. There are no shamans existing anymore, but for many years they were very important. The shaman was someone who was basically born with the ability to heal people, 
but not in the sense that we think of healing like broken bones and, and cuts. This shaman was more of a spiritual healer. I like to think of him like a psychiatrist. And they, they were regarded with awe and fear by the other members of the tribe. The shaman didn't live with the tribe. They had to live separately because they had so much power with them. It would affect everyone in the tribe. And the shamans had certain special things that they wore, like the doctors we know wear a white coat. These shamans would wear a special cape that had deer hooves attached to the bottom to make a noise when they moved. They would wear special crowns and hats. They had special rattles. They had uh, tattoos on their chests. They would have bone amulets that would make noises. And all of these things had representations of the spirit helpers of the shamans. There were certain animals that were regarded as spirit helpers. And they were more powerful because they could go from one part of being to another. They could go from the sea to the land like a frog. Or they could go from the sea to the air to the land like an oyster catcher. And then there were mythical figures that also helped them. And this is a picture of something called a soul catcher, which is carved like a two-headed dragon. And uh, what would happen is someone would get very ill and very despondent and they would be afraid that their soul had been stolen by a witch, because they had witches too, you know, good, evil, all of that stuff. So the shaman's job was to figure out who had stolen the soul, take the soul catcher and catch it back, and then go to the person who had lost it and blow it back into them. They also couldn't cut their hair, so they had to have special combs that they would wear, and this is a picture of a shaman's comb that has a spirit on it when the shaman would go into a trance to commune with his spirit helpers, it would be a transformation. So the uh, people carved things to represent this called transformation masks. It was a mask that had two images, not just one. And they were moving masks. So this, this is a picture of a transformation mask of, an, of a raven. And then when it opened, like the raven is here in the beak, and when the beak opens this way and this way, you can see a face inside. And this is a shaman's rattle. It's in the image of an owl. And the owl is special because it's a night animal as opposed to a day animal, so, and it turns its head very strangely. And this is a picture of a shaman's crown. Every, uh, some of them were made out of bear claws, and some of them were carved. This one is carved out of wood, and there's a different face on each of the prongs that go up. The more images there are, the more powerful the shaman, because he has more spirits helping him. And the most they would have was eight. So this is an eight-pronged shaman's crown. Actually, that crown was so powerful, we bought it. And we had it in our house for a number of years. And every time I walked by it, I would just feel, <laughs> feel the energy from that. And, and I, I said to Paul, you know, when we, when we downsized our house to move into an apartment on the key, I said, you know, I think we need to sell this because it's just too powerful. You could feel it. I could feel it, so we did, we did sell that one, yeah. It came from a museum, it went back to a museum. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad it's, it we passed it on, yes. <laughs> the, you're only a caretaker. Yeah. You're not a possessor. We, we took care of it for a while and then we passed it along. And this is a shaman's necklace. There's a picture of a shaman's necklace with all these different amulets hanging down. One is an uh, image of a land otter because the otters live on the land and the sea, so they're also spirit helpers for the shamans. One is an octopus, and then there's a little man. You can see different images on these. An oyster catcher rattle, remember I said the oyster catcher goes from the land to the sea. It transforms into different areas, and it's a shaman's helper. This particular rattle shows a shaman catching a witch. The typical image is they're holding the witch by the, by the braid in the back of the head. They're getting the spirit out that way. And then there's a bear helper, and there's a ram helper, and, and on the back, all on the back of the oyster catcher. And they respected nature. When they killed an animal, they said, thank you for giving me your, your meat and your pelt.
and they had a great concept of ownership. We didn't own, nobody in the village owned anything. Oh, it was all communal, and everybody was the caretaker of the land and the animals and the sea and to have, pass it on to the next generation. Have, yeah. But we were just caretakers. Well, here, we're here, we don't own anything. Oh, but they needed to know the cycles, so you think about it, so they knew when the salmon would come back upstream so they could go fish and get salmon. They knew when it was best time to catch the halibut. They had to know the cycles of nature, where, where, where they're gonna find the berries and when's the best time to get berries from the forest so they could live. So yeah, they studied the cycles of nature and lived within nature rather than trying to change nature. So, so with our study of the native arts of the Northwest and with our contact with many dealers and museum curators and, and artists themselves, we were approached by actually three different museums to do three very different shows. The first and biggest of the shows, the entrance is pictured here, was at the Historical Museum of South Florida, now called History Miami in downtown Miami. Uh, this was the most comprehensive show with over 200 pieces from our collection. And in each of these shows, because of our knowledge and Joan's interest and knowledge of anthropology, they invited us to co-curate with the museum specialist, which was a great fun learning about museums and how they display and how they organize shows. So in this show, Joan's idea was to organize the images and the stories along three main areas, the land, the sea, and the air. Uh, this is, by the way, this is a picture of a docent showing the crowds around our, the exhibit that they had. In the history of this museum, this was exhibit drew the largest crowds of anything they've had before or since. This first image comes from the area of the sea. And it's a very famous uh, carver did this match, Willie Seaweed, in about the 1920s. And this depicts a killer whale. On the top of his head is his dorsal fin coming out of his sides or the flukes of the killer whale. And so this is one image from the sea. Uh, this next area depicts the sky. And so the two images on the left represent the sun and the moon, the dominant bodies we see during the daylight and nighttime sky. And then the two images in the middle show thunderbirds. And then on the right are two other avian creatures. This is from the land. And as we mentioned, the beaver was very important in, in the land stories. And so the three images in the middle are different depictions of beaver. One of them is modern and one of them is quite old. And the one on the lower right is actually uh, one, of the car one of the masts of Sinoqua, the wild woman of the woods. And you can see her pursed blood red lips and the hair coming out of all parts of her face. The image on the lower left is, is a beer image. Totem poles were an important part of the exhibit, an important part of the, the culture, as Joan had mentioned. And this is a variety of totem poles that we have accumulated. We did have 13-foot uh, and 15-foot poles in the exhibit, but these are smaller poles ranging in size from 4 feet to 7 feet. The one on the extreme left is a pole that was in the collection of Senator John Warner of Virginia. One in the middle, uh, it represents a raven on the top, was the pole that was outside the Hudson Bay store in British Columbia. The one next to it with the white face represents a mortuary pole, or a pole that would be erected on the death of a very famous uh, person of the tribe, and the white face indicates this person has died. The one on the right-hand side is a pole that was collected by missionaries in the 1920s in Haines, Alaska. And let's look at that pole a little more so you can see some of the iconography. At the top of that pole are three watchmen. Now there are three, not four. And the reason there are three, if you think about where these tribes were and where they lived, they had to worry about people coming from, from the north, from the south, from the sea, but their mountains on the east side of the village were relatively protected. So the watchmen only had to look in three directions, not four. And so typically when you see these watchmen on top of anything or depicted in drawings, there are only three of them, not four. The next image down is a bear eating a, a land otter. Directly under that is another land otter. And the bottom image is the bear mother, a bear holding something, a cub, or in many cases, a person. So bear, like Mother Earth, is very important in protecting us like our mothers protect us.
This is a quote from Aldona Junaitis. Aldona became our friend. Aldona was the assistant director of the American Museum of Natural History in New York and subsequently went to Alaska. She was an anthropologist by study. She became director of the University of Alaska and the Museum of the North. And what she said, again, Joan mentioned this, this is a living culture. It's not an extinct culture like the Egyptians we study. Unlike most other native North American native groups, the present-day artists of the Northwest Coast maintain intimate ties with early artistic tradition. So this is a picture of an old button blanket. The button blankets all had the same basic formula. There was red and black wool and outlined figures with white buttons. So the central figure in this blanket you see is a beer. This is an old blanket. Here is a new blanket that was done by a contemporary woman, Hazel Simeon. It's also a button blanket, but you can see now there are many more colors of the wool. She uses materials such as hammered copper, hammered aluminum. There are seashells on the blanket. There are some buttons as well, uh, and as well as a lot of beads. So this is much more elaborate, but this echoes back to the older tradition of the original button blanket. Here you see some woven baskets, and basketry was a very important for the people of the Northwest Coast utilitarian. They stored things in these baskets, and they also embellished them with these beautiful geometric patterns. These are glass baskets done by a contemporary glass blower, Preston Singletary. And you can see it echoes the shape and patterns that you can see in the older basket. And Preston, in very many museums, he trained with uh, Chihuly in the Northwest Coast, and very, very collectible and very well known. His first piece, Preston Singletary's very first piece, echoes back to this chief's or potlatch hat. And you see the shape of the hat, but what Preston did is he blew it in glass and then turned it over. So what was traditionally a chief's hat in Preston's image becomes a glass bowl. And what he further did is he etched an image of, of a raven on top of the bowl. So when the light shines down, the shadow that that bowl casts would become a raven that you could see on the flat surface underneath the bowl. The final thing we want to, I want to show you in the contemporary jewelry has been very important. Joan is wearing a number Actually, of pieces of jewelry. And on this image, you can see on the upper left a, a holder with a silver orb in the mouth, the raven holding the sun, as you heard from her story. Open the mouth, take out the piece, open it up, it becomes a necklace with an image of the sun on it that Joan is now wearing. Our interacting with other people, our museum shows, has had some unintended consequence, little known to us, when Art and Antique magazine decided to highlight what they considered the 100 top collections in America of all genre, they highlighted our collection because of our interest and our knowledge of the Northwest Coast tribes. We've had wonderful interactions with people and museums and, and artists, and this is an ongoing passion of ours. But this is a wonderful story about how our husbandry of one of the pieces, one of the most important pieces in our collection that now is in a museum that Joan wants to tell you. I love the story. When the chiefs celebrate, they wore a cape. And one of the most special capes was a Chilkat blanket. We owned a Chilkat blanket for many years that was made by a woman called Mary Ebbets Hunt. She was a princess from one tribe who married a chief in another tribe. She had 12 children, and she wove a blanket for each one of her children. These blankets are six feet wide by eight, six feet long with fringes. They're enormous. So I think each one must have taken a, at least a year to do. What the women did when they made a weaving was they would weave in a special design in the corner. That's how we know that it was her blanket that we owned. Uh, the men did not sign their pieces, didn't sign their carvings for, for many, many years, but the women did put their signature in by a design. This blanket filled an entire wall in our house. So when we decided to move out of a house into a small apartment, this blanket wouldn't fit because then we couldn't display very much else. So we decided to sell it. I called Christie's and they said they weren't selling native 
pieces anymore. I should call a dealer in New York, and they gave me his name and number. So I called him, and I told him what we had, and he said, oh, you need to call Christie's. So I said, well, I already spoke to Christie's. They said, no, you need to talk to this particular person who does auctions in Paris. And I said, OK. So I called up this woman, who was lovely. I told her what we had. And she was very excited. She took several of our pieces, including the Chilcat blanket. Not only did she take the blanket, but she put a full page in the catalog on our blanket. She researched and put in a photograph of the woman who made it. She researched and found a photograph of a chief wearing our blanket, or one very similar, that was taken by Edward Curtis in the early 1900s. So this had provenance. That means that you could trace the ownership and you knew what the history of the piece was. The auction came, and the blanket didn't sell. She called me up and she said, I can't believe the blanket didn't sell because it's so important. There are only 12 in the world. I said, I'm very surprised. She said, you have three post-auction offers. What happens is when something doesn't sell, people think they might be able to get it for a little bit less money, so they put in an offer. Two of the offers were less than what we, we wanted, but they were cash. The other offer was the price that we wanted, but whoever was bidding would have to wait and see if they could get the money from the Canadian government to allow them to purchase it. She said, they may or may not get it, and you don't know how long it will be, you'd have to wait. And I said, you know, I think we'll wait and see what happens with that offer. We anticipated that this was a museum that was interested in this blanket, and we really wanted it to be in a museum. It was that important a piece. So after about six months, the auctioneer finally called me and said, well, they got the money. I'm sending you the check, and I'm sending them the blanket. And she was glad to be done with the whole thing. I said, could you tell me who purchased the blanket? So she called me back and she said, yes, the Umista Cultural Center in Haida Gwaii purchased the blanket. And if you want, you can go to YouTube and see the welcome home party they had for the blanket. So of course, we went to YouTube. <laughs> and it was called the Paris Blanket. I don't think it's up on YouTube anymore, because this was many years ago. They had the blanket displayed on a big table. They were all dressed in their finery with their capes and their drums and their rattles and their headdresses. And they were dancing and they were singing around this blanket. They were so excited to have it. It turned out the woman who made the blanket lived in that community. Her descendants still lived in that community. And they were thrilled to have it back. So the director of the cultural center got on YouTube and she said, we only heard about this auction the day before it was going to take place. And we knew that we could never get this blanket unless it didn't sell. And then the vendors were willing to wait and for us to get the money from the Canadian government. She said, and the spirit of Anna Slaga, Mary Ebbets Hunt, was watching over this blanket to make sure it came home. This was such an important event in the culture of the native people from this area that this appeared in the National Post. The National Post is a Canadian version of USA Today. It's a big national magazine. And the headline reads, Vancouver Island First Nation recovers historic blanket that turned up in Paris auction a hundred years after it disappeared. And the story goes on to say how important this piece is culturally in this community. To conclude, this has been an ongoing shared passion for the two of us. First deciding to collect this, but more important than possessing the pieces and gathering the pieces is understanding the meaning of the pieces and connecting with the people and the cultures of the Northwest Coast. And so I'd like to read this, this quote because it really capsulizes why we still are so excited about this. Our collecting has diminished a bit because we don't have the space anymore. But our interest in our continued research and our contact with these people has gone on. Images seem to speak to the eye, but they actually address the mind. They are ways of thinking in the guise of seeing. The eye can sometimes be satisfied with form alone, but the mind can only be satisfied with meaning. One piece of 
sheep horn, so it's a big sheep. They carve it and warm it and bend it and shape it. This is the abalone. They inlay abalone it with abalone. Shell. Yeah. And this represents an eagle, and it's carved all over yeah. with, with different images. And this is a, also made from a horn. They use that during the potlatches, potlatch and the feast. They bring out this stuff when they have company. If you focus on one thing that speaks to you, whatever that thing is, whether it's Old Masters or Northwest Coast or Toasters, you narrow, and I gotta tell you, by having this collection uh, prevented us over, if, if from over, buying lots okay, of things yeah. when we travel because we say, you know what, yeah, we could afford it, but we don't have room for it, we, we're focusing on this. Okay. So that's number one. And number two, become an expert in whatever that field is and then talk to other collectors. So this is a very significant piece. So there was one of the missionaries from Scotland that went to this region uh, was Dundas in the early 1800s. And he spent a significant amount of time there and he, the, the Native American gave him presents when he was uh, there as a missionary. He went back to Scotland. There were 55 pieces he brought home with him. They all stayed within the family up until about uh, maybe 20, 25 years ago. The Susan Point piece, she's, she's got an enormous piece at the entrance of the Museum of, National Museum wow. of American Indian, and it's a person. Oh, yeah, I saw it. it. It turns. Whoa. And it becomes a beaver. And it's actually a spindle whorl. It looks like a top and has a stick going through the middle. Yeah. And they're, you know, they're not very large. They're about the size of the hand. And they use them when they, when they turn the sheep wool into fiber. Sinopo is the wild woman. Yeah. Buckwiss is the wild man, of course. When he opens, there's a face inside. Oh, Isn't that my. cool? Well, this is the person. And That's this the is person. the spirit. Oh. He envelops the person, huh? Fascinating. Yeah. yeah. We gave um, a class at FIU to their one of their anthropology classes. We brought this piece in, and we brought a few other pieces in for show and tell, and we told them about the culture of the Northwest. Um, after the talk, this young man comes up to me, and he says, I really enjoyed your talk. Can you tell me where I can get one of those? <laughs> As if. And, you know, a college student. And I said, well, I said, you know, you can probably find one online. I said, why, why would you need one. And he said, well, I have eight brothers and sisters, and I think it would be really great if I had one of those. They would listen to me. And I said, you were listening to the talk. It was very good. Yeah.